Greetings to everyone present. My name is Ankit Malhotra. I am the co-founder and president of the Jindal Society of International Law, which is a student-led initiative under the AGs for the Center for the Study of United Nations under the expert guidance and tutelage of Professor Dr. Weston Mutwalski. The Society is an initiative to provide a platform to young international law enthusiasts to nurture their interest. The Society was officially launched and inaugurated on the 18th day of November in 2020 by the Herbert and Rose Rubin Professor of International Law, Professor Jose Enrique Alvarez of New York University. Along with, the, along with our respected Vice Chancellor, Professor Dr. Siraj Kumar, the faculty coordinator and, and director, Professor Dr. Weston Kowalski, and a very dear friend of the Center and Society, Professor Dr. Mohan Kumar. The purpose of this society is to increase the student engagement with the various matters of international law. And we pride ourselves in being an institution which focuses its attention on skill building and also increasing the knowledge database available to our student members. The society is an attempt also to streamline the lacuna between resources and inculcating an overall interest in the vast expanses of international law. We aim to provide a space to young international law enthusiasts to nurture their interest in this field. The spring lecture series of 2022 entitled Colloquium on Challenges to Global Governance and Humanities in the 21st Century offers a compendium of scholarship from the academy and professional experience from the bar. Over the past year, the society has hosted over 100 renowned speakers from foreign universities, the International Law Commission, international law firms, the United Nations, the Institut de Droit International, the World Bank, and also the Hague Academy of International Law. Through our previous series, we endeavored to study the different contours of international law through our speakers who covered and addressed their respective areas of expertise based upon their years of research and practice. Given the vast ecosystems and engagement of international law in it, the society aimed to study the fragmentation and fertilization of the various disciplines in this ecosystem of public and private international law. Over the years, the society as a result of its initiatives become a place of thought-provoking discussions and exploring the ecosystem of international law. Thus, as a result to our spring lecture series, it is important to understand the law and its challenges from broader, different and differing vantage points. Acknowledging that international law is a creation of states, it is also important to appreciate and understand the social sciences that have played a critical role in shaping this law. Through our series, it is also hoped that one will develop a deeper understanding of Philip Cheswick's magnum opus, A Modern Law of Nations and Introduction, when he said, and I quote, so long as the international community is composed of states, it is only through an exercise of their will as expressed through treaty or agreement or as laid down by an international authority deriving its power from states that the rule of law comes binding. And therefore to speak today about the, to the uttermost parts of the earth, we have amongst us the giant, and I hold his book up in celebration of his constant support to all the society's initiatives and endeavors we have amongst us Professor Martin Koskinemi, who is a professor emeritus of international, of international law at the University of Helsinki. He was also a member of the Finnish Diplomatic Service from 1978 to 1994 and the International Law Commission in 2002 to 2006. He is also a member of the Institute de Droit International, fellow of the British Academy and a member of the American Academy of Arts and Sciences. His main publications include Giants, which all of us have studied, from apology to utopia, the structure of international legal argument, the gentle civilizer of nations, the rise and fall of international law from 1870 to 1960, the politics of international law, and now to the utter uttermost parts of the human earth, legal imagination and international power from 1300 to 1870. To comment and to share their perspectives on this book, we also have amongst us Mr. Christian Poggies, who is a doctoral student at the Max Planck Institute for International for, for Legal History and Legal Theory in Frankfurt and a member of the editorial team of Workers Blog. He is a graduate of, of, of the MA program at International Studies, Peace and Conflict Research at the Goethe Institute in Frankfurt and the Technical University in Darmstadt. With a specialization in globalization and law, his research focuses on the intersection of the law of the sea and methods of global legal history and historical international relations. 
We also have amongst us Professor Hendrik Simon, who is a historian and social scientist. He is a lecturer at the Goethe Institute uh, University in Frankfurt and a research associate at the Peace Research Institute Frankfurt. He's also a visiting fellow at the Center for Advanced International Theory in the University of Sussex in 2017 and the University of Vienna in 2018-16 at the Max Planck Institute for European Legal History in Frankfurt at the uh, Cluster for Excellence Normative Orders. He's also an editor at the Wordplay blog. Among his main publications include The Myths of Mare Liberum, Use at Bellum, Justifying War in the 19th, legal, 19th, legal, 19th Century Legal History and Political Science in the European Journal of International Law. He's also written other articles, and we are so grateful to have everybody amongst us to join us. Uh, Professor Simon has also started a postdoctoral fellowship at the Peace Research Institute in Frankfurt. With that, I thank all, all of our, all or everyone here to, to have joined us on this august occasion. And now I invite Professor Koskiniemi to start the discussion following which we will have comments from everyone. So the floor is yours. Thank you very much, Dr. Malhotra. I'm really pleased to be here present with the uh, uh, Jindal Global Law School and to once again present my newest creation the, to the outermost parts of the earth. Um, uh, what I intend to do, and if I can uh, share the screen first, what I intend to do uh, today is to give an introduction to the book, really. So uh, the presentation will be in three parts. I'll first say a few general words about the approach that this book takes on the, uh, what preceded international, modern international law from 1873. Then I'll uh, rapidly go through the 12 chapters and try to outline the argument that the book makes about 500 years of legal development, I suggest that the book tries to be something like a legal history of capitalism. And then thirdly, I'll summarize with some of the methodological or theoretical points that the book uh, makes. So to start biographically, so my, my previous book um, that Ankit uh, refer, referred to, uh, the Gentle Civilizer of Nations was a history of ideas of modern international law that I dated to begin with the establishment of the Institut de Droit International, the Institute of International Law in 1873. Now, many people thought that there was a, uh, that was a valid point, at least to some extent, to say that international law is a, is a really recent creation, a creation from the last third of the 19th century. But that arose the question as to what was there before the late 19th century. And this thousand page book uh, is an extended response to uh, that query. And I will suggest in this book that before 1873, there was no single tradition of international law. There is no continuous Western or European international law that spans from some uh, place and time way in the past, let's say the peace of Westphalia or maybe the European Renaissance, the, uh, the Roman Empire or whatever, um, uh, moments have been suggested as potential starting points for international law. No, nope. I persist in insisting that modern international law as we know it is a creation of 1873. And so, but what did exist before that was a series of legal languages, legal languages through which ambitious European men tried to exercise power outside their domestic realm. These languages included the language of Roman law or civil law, the language inscribed in the Justinian code from the sixth century uh, Christian era, the language of Jus Gentium, which has a partly separate existence from Roman civil law, the language of droit public de l'Europe, uh, which I have 
here mentioned in French because it is a French concoction for certain types of diplomatic uh, contact and treaty making practice that existed in the from the 15th to the 18th century. Uh, from Britain, uh, lawyers have looked outside the British Isles through the languages of the royal prerogative and the common law, and in many places, the language of the law of nature or natural law has been employed. So I suggest that there is this disparate series of professional vocabularies that lawyers have used in order to try to grasp for themselves and for others uh, in legal terms uh, what takes place outside the domestic realm. They haven't done this out of intellectual interest only. Uh, on the contrary, they've done this in order to be able to justify forms of exercise of power outside the domestic realm. They have usually come to these problems in terms of uh, in moments of special crisis uh, when they've encountered something that is hard or at least difficult to explain by reference to other um, professional vocabularies than the lawyer, than the legal. So I use in this book a lot the expressions bricolage and imagination. By bricolage, I want to sketch the professional character of legal work when lawyers are called upon to articulate in legal terms events, relationships, hierarchies, hegemonies, and institutions that uh, operate or that they meet with when they come to um, deal with matters outside uh, their home, uh, outside their home. Bricolage, of course, comes from, uh, more has been, it comes from many places, but has been most famously used by the French anthropologist Claude Lévi-Strauss to describe the science of the concrete that he found that the indigenous person of uh, working in, he was uh, doing field work in Brazilian rainforests, mostly other places as well, but mostly in Brazil, he found that the uh, concrete science of the indigenous when he or she met up with problems was to deal with that problem through gathering ideas and instruments and experiences close by and combining them in an imaginative fashion so as to be able to grasp and deal with whatever the new problem was that had a reason. So bricolage is not a theory drawn thing. It's not a series of deductions from large principles to, uh, to practices. It is instead a really practical job in which uh, we as lawyers deal with uh, problems as they emerge by looking back at uh, texts and practices that are familiar to us and trying and try to relate them to each other and derive instructions from them so as to deal with this new problem that has arisen. So it's a practice drawn thing. It's a very concrete thing. Uh, and it's a thing that always takes place when there's not enough time. Every lawyer, I think, knows the experience that you've given a job and you say, well, this would take six months for me to do. But actually, the court case is in two weeks and you have to deal with it in those terms. So you just run back to the books that you know from the shelves or the memos that you've written in the previous case, and you try to combine from that uh, professionally justifiable set of conclusions or articulations to whatever the new problem is. So that's what I think of as bricolage. And as I described it, it has to do with imagination. Um, uh, but as I said, um, the uh, lawyers who developed these various languages were not uh, predominantly intellectually interested in that. Instead, they wanted to have a grasp on power. They wanted to understand relationships of power, but above all, they wanted to justify, stabilize, and critique forms of power 
through a legal vocabulary, namely forms of power that in some ways engaged events or people uh, or problems situated outside the sphere of, of application of domestic law. And this leads me to the two ways in which I so see language as power, how I see law's power as the power of the legal language. First of all, law's power is the power of framing. Law, det <coughs> Sorry. <clears throat> law determines the grammar of legal authority, the grammar of professionally competent speech what it is allowed to say in order to justify, stabilize, or critique or some of something. Uh, there was a time, of course, when one could say, for example, that this thing is right because God commanded it. But there was then a moment emerged when that sort of language was no longer available to you. It was not a professional thing to say. Um, the... Uh, 500 years that I uh, ex try to examine in this book uh, presents a number of different ways in which law has framed the experience that lawyers and other people have of the world, has suggested an interpretation of the world, which in, a, um, in an important sense frames uh, the imagination through which bricolage then um, can take place. Uh, in this famous image that I show here of Hans Holbein's, the ambassadors, we see a complex uh, set of symbolisms uh, that all manifest a particular grammar of what it is to be a diplomat. And that dip diplomacy is about the grandeur, not only of the diplomat, but above all of the uh, princes, they represent the communities for which they work, their cultural uh, alignments, and so on. So law frames the experience of the world. It tells us what kinds of things it is uh, competent to say in the process of justifying or critiquing power, and what kinds of arguments you cannot say meaningful. Uh, if your, if your intention is to move within the realm of power. The second type of way logs power operates as the power of language is through articulation. So when lawyers operate out there in the world, either at home or outside, what the, the, the legal power invites those to whom it's directed to yield to the authority of the competent legal speaker. So law's power in this sense is a relational power. It is the, a relationship between the one who speaks authoritatively and the one who yields to the, uh, to the truth that the person who speaks authoritatively puts forward. And of course, that law's power as articulation in those innumerable bilateral relationships falls within law's, this larger institutional power, if you wish, which is the power of framing. And throughout this work, I move between these two types of power that the law has. The law frames the understanding that we have of the world, and the law provides us with uh, relationships in which some people are call, called upon to make authoritative statements, whilst other people are expected to yield to the authoritative statements that the former make. The book deals with two ruling vocabularies within law that frame the experience uh, that we have of the world in legal terms. I suggest here quite radically that these two vocabularies frame 100% of the legal experience we have of the world. And I examine the development of European efforts to rule uh, over Europe as well as the non-European world through these two languages of sovereignty and property. These languages originally 
refer back to a theological understanding of the world, more, more specifically, a Christian understanding of the world, where the world was given to human beings, so as to, for those human beings to rule over the world. And in the process, that, that's quite, uh, of course, famously from the Genesis in the Bible, and to rule over the world, these humans who had been created free had decided to divide the world in two ways. On the one hand, they had decided to divide it between sovereigns, between princes, uh, to rule over communities. Uh, the early uh, theologians from the 16th century Spanish universities called this Dominium Juristictionis, where we recognize the word jurisdiction as the measure of the power of the rulers, that power that we nowadays have been accustomed to calling sovereignty. On the other hand, they also divided the, the free individuals that Rod had created, had divided the world, uh, world's resources uh, among themselves so as to create the notion of property. Although, as Bible tells us, the world was initially donated to humans in common, the story of the paradise, the, the fall justifies the, uh, the, 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 the set of interrelationships where humans are called upon to labor in order to get their livelihood and to labor efficiently uh, the humans created free again, uh, decided to de divide the properties among themselves. So throughout this book, I examine the way in which notions of sovereignty and property frame, frame the legal experience and put the limits to what it is that can be meaningfully, that is to say professionally argued in contexts where people want to exercise power. So that's the end of my first, uh, the first part. I move on now to the second part, which is just a brief overview of the contents of the book. The book consists of, um, of 12 chapters, uh, which can be grouped There's a, in two groups. A first set of four chapters examines the formation of the frame, if you wish, uh, of legal power, starting from the year 1300. The second set of chapters examines three domestic contexts, namely the French, the English, and the German contexts, as contexts from which legal imagining began uh, when uh, the legal argument was chosen or became the one through which ambitious elites um, uh, wished to justify and exercise their power over their domestic uh, worlds as well as over the non-domestic world. I begin uh, chapter one uh, in, in France uh, with a story about the consolidation of France as a regnum, uh, as a government over a territory, which we then quite have called the French territory, the Hexagon, uh, in which Philippe the Fair uh, uh, rules with a very distinguished and large group of Roman lawyers. He was the first European ruler who relied upon in his ruling almost completely on a group of, uh, of lawyers having been educated in Bologna, uh, in Northern Italy, as well as in Montpellier in France, uh, uh, and whose understanding of what it is to rule was completely dictated by the idea of rulership uh, transmitted in the uh, in the uh, Corpus Juris Civilis, in the Justinian Code, in the Civil Code. 
and the civil code communicated a very powerful sense of rulership that contrasted with the feudal relationships that had existed in most of Europe at the time. The king was dominus, uh, and, he, and the king had dominium uh, over his subjects. And in France, that idea of dominium was consolidated in the reign of Philippe the Fair. I describe this to great extent. This had both domestic and international implications, international to the extent that this idea of the king as an emperor in his realm meant that there was no emperor of the world that who could have ruled over the French king. At the same time, I describe the consolidation and professionalization of commercial practices in France, uh, through which the tr uh, trade fairs in France and elsewhere were organized, and of which, and which created the taxation base from which the French king eventually became completely dependent. I describe the ways in which the uh, French king uh, began to justify his extraction of resources from the realm, as well as the limits that the idea of property put to his uh, way of, uh, of exerting those resources from his subjects. His subjects that were now seen as his subjects in addition to being the feudal vassals to the large group of feudal lords governing bits and pieces of French territory. Uh, uh, chapter two then examines the professionalization and universalization of the language created in France in part by theologians such as Thomas Aquinas, in part by the, the Roman lawyers to whom I referred by the group of Dominican theologians who were active, especially in the uh, University of Salamanca in the early 16th century. Francisco de Vitoria, Domingo de Soto um, are well known, then later on Jesuits such as Luis uh, de Molina and so on. There, um, in the context of teaching young clerics on the practices of confession, these academic lawyers who also acted as confessors to great lords and even to the king himself, uh, and the emperor, that is to say, Charles V, um, they developed the two notions of dominium jurisdictionis and dominium proprietatis in response to, to important events surrounding the expansion of Spain. On the one hand, this had to do with the uh, uh, discovery, as they believed, of the new world and the question of how to treat the Indians uh, and how to treat Indian property. Are Indian chiefs, are they sovereigns and have Indians the right of property? On the other hand, they also were worried about the constant expansion of economic relations, commercial relations that were boosted by the massive importation of silver from the Spanish colonies and that uh, cre created um, a, a great um, flurry of economic activities, not only in Spain, but also everywhere in Europe. That led to the development of a commercial ethic in which the gathering of private property became uh, a, a, a really a basic preoccupation of large parts of European elites and the Spanish um, Dominican theologians needed to take a position to that. And in that uh, uh, project, they, did, they uh, created the notion of dominium proprietatis, sovereignty and property. In chapter three, I examine an anti-theological uh, set of set, uh, operations uh, taking place under the Roman law um, uh, idiom by the Protestant refugee from Italy uh, in England who became the professor of civil law at the University of Oxford, Alberico Gentili. Gentili 
uh, uh, in his De Jure Belli on the law of war, developed a new approach to uh, law outside the realm that was based on natural law that used the resources uh, mostly of the Roman civil law, expanding them into a, a universal law that above all supported domestic absolutism as well as um, a kind of raison d'etat, a diplomatically well-developed set of propositions about warfare and diplomacy. For Gentili, law, natural law was a set of rational uh, interest-based uh, interest conclusions regarding what states, uh, I'm sorry, what princes should do in relations, uh, in their relationship with each other. And he famously was completely opposed to the idea that theologians or that theology would have anything to say about the formation of those rules. Those rules were practical diplomatic rules that looked above all towards the consolidation of a, a group of states in a system of states. The fourth and last point in this first part of the chapters I look at Grotius, Hugo Grotius, and I suggest that in Grotius, law separates itself both from theology on the one hand, as well as from raison d'etat on the other. As is well known, uh, Grotius wrote his main work, De Urebelia Aquacis in Paris, where he met and had several conversations with the powerful Cardinal Richelieu, whom he learned to dislike and whose ideas he detested. These were, of course, ideas of raison d'etat. And Grotius, in his famous uh, argument against uh, the skeptic Carneades, made the argument that law has an autonomous existence. Law is autonomous from interest of state as well as from uh, religion. Well, it's, it's instead based on the idea of sociability, of human sociability. Grotius wanted to create a, a scientific idea of law and his idea of what would be a scientific uh, idea of law was that it would reflect what the nature of human beings and what separated human beings from other living creatures was that human be beings could operate beyond their immediate interests. That is to say, as Grotius puts it a number of times in his main work, that human beings are able uh, to commit themselves to rules. And to commit oneself to a rule means that you are able to see beyond your momentary interest in order to, um, to live by uh, rules. And this uh, ability to live by rules is the legal heart of the notion of sociability on which uh, Grotius builds his specific idea of law as an autonomous set of propositions, neither derivable from raison d'etat nor from theological principles. The second part of the chapters uh, deal with how these ideas then are developed and used in practical contexts in France or by French lawyers and diplomats and political thinkers, by English uh, men, as well as then by Germans. The, the three chapters of the French story can be summarized as a story of law in the service of absolutism um, in the 17th century to its development towards something like social science in the early years of the 19th century. The three chapters, the three French chapters start out by explaining the 17th century absolutism in France as a, a particular application of an idea of sovereignty, sovereignty as the king who embodies the state. The apocryphal statement by Louis XIV, the Sun King, L'État c'est moi, I am the state, epitomizes that idea that the king is, uh, embodies uh, the state, 
But at the same time, I examined in great detail the system of venal office holding, the system in France that developed whereby at the very moment when uh, Louis XIV reigned, there were the French state could uh, rightly uh, or, or truthfully be described as a private, as a set of private uh, in, um, uh, arrangements uh, that lead to the French state being divided into over 50,000 venal office holders. So a venal office holder is a person who holds their off, who has bought their way in the office and holds the office as private property. And it's a private property in the way that it can also be inherited by their eldest sons. And this was the system whereby the French state was able to create its um, the economic basis from which the king could then rule and decide on his foreign policy operations. Um, here in the in the French realm uh, in the 17th century, the royal sovereignty and private property are completely amalgamated together, so that one cannot be separated from another. The French state was owned by a group of oligarchic families. At the same time, it was ruled by, uh, by a king dependent on those families or both sides mutually dependent. The revolution, as I described, destroyed that system in the name of private property. The revolution uh, was initiated by an economic, a series of economic problems to which the physiocrats intellectuals who were imagining an, a, a new type of economy gave a recipe. Namely, you should think, start to think about the economy as something separate from the political realm. And uh, the, uh, the ideas of the physiocrats were subscribed by many of the revolutionaries, in, including above all Condorcet, and I examine at the end of my French chapters the way in which French thinkers in the early 19th century tried to create a social science that would embody the inherent rules of the economy so as to allow uh, the French to rule France and their colonial uh, possessions better. My second set of, uh, of uh, chapter, three chapters, eight, nine, and 10, have to do with England. I call this an, uh, the formation of an economic notion of statehood throughout the uh, 16th century, the Tudor realm, as well as the Stuart, um, the Stuart kings who followed up when Elizabeth I died childless. Uh, they were in constant negotiation with noble lords about the extent of their powers, especially their taxation powers. Eventually, in the Glorious Revolution, uh, they had to give up uh, their ability to tax um, the uh, Englishmen, uh, even at the risk of, even for the defense of foreign policy interests, something that the kings until then had been seen as coming under the royal prerogative and to which the uh, common law would not apply, including the idea that no taxation without representation would apply. So uh, uh, as the uh, bourgeois society that England then became after the glorious revolution in the 18th century consolidated itself, it consolidated itself through the mercantile elites creating a, a, a global network of commercial relations, which was gradually legalized uh, under the common law instead of the royal prerogative, which was the civil law based system through which the, uh, the dualistic English legal world had been governed until um, the 18th century. So I describe here the division of English legal attitudes, our lingua, uh, lingua, uh, legal professional uh, languages into those of royal prerogative that highlights the role of the king as the emperor of the realm. Gentili was a great supporter of the royal prerogative. And on the other hand, common law with Sir Edward Cook, 
uh, that gradually took over the special courts under which the royal prerogative was being applied and then led to the expansion uh, of, uh, or led to the justification of the expansion of, uh, of a set of commercial laws under the influential uh, decisions by Lord Mansfield in the late 18th century. I finish with the two German chapters, which trace the transformations of uh, the naturalist thinking up to that moment into the formation of four new uh, authoritative vocabularies, namely political science, economics, philosophy, and diplomacy. So I trace the developments in German uni Enlightenment universities, uh, from the um, uh, adoption of, uh, of Hugo Grotius's natural law by uh, Samuel Pufendorf uh, into the main language of political thought in Germany at the end of the 17th century. This then becomes studied and formalized in the German Enlightenment universities in Halle, at the end of the 17th century and in Göttingen at the beginning of the 18th century, where uh, professors start to discuss natural law in terms of empirical social, uh, empirical political science um, in a process that leads in the early 19th century to the creation of political science as a discipline. At the same time, one part of the natural law teaching turns into the teaching of Polizei or policy, Polizeiwissenschaft, also Polizeirecht, uh, law of policy, uh, made famous recently by Foucault, Michel Foucault, and Foucauldian studies on, on policy science, which then transforms itself, it's a well known process, into economics. I examine Kant's critique of the miserable comforters and Kant's effort to inaugurate philosophy as the master science of the university, including the master science of law. Kant had a very critical view of lawyers as dabblers in minor things and believed that only through philosophical reflection of a particular type, we can understand what rights and duties people have. And then the fourth transformation was diplomacy. And I tried to show how Georg Friedrich von Martens at the end of the 18th century, when, the natural law, when natural law in its classical mode is already dying out, changes the teaching of natural law into teaching of European public law and thereby also um, uh, a European law of nations. So uh, the German chapters do those four things. They'll show how the earlier vocabularies change into these four vocabularies that we know as well. Then in the epilogue, I reflect a little bit on this story and then I demonstrate in a, a very brief section as to how in the aftermath of the revolution of 1848. In, uh, in France and in Germany in particular, a new language of solidarity, a new language of community, including the Internationale Gemeinschaft, the international community or international society, uh, whichever, so Tönnies is, is not relevant here, um, whichever expression one wants to know, emerges where a liberal lawyers in the middle of the 19th century tried to reimagine a law of nations that would not be the conservative system of diplomacy that existed under the so-called Concert of Europe and which sought its justification from Martensian ideas of diplomacy. Uh, this effort by the uh, post-revolutionary liberals in the 1860s, however, lost out to a competing uh, suggestion, which was to not to think in terms of an international community or an international society, but instead to think in terms of civilization. Uh, and this is Johann Kaspar Blunchli, 
who becomes one of the founders of the Institut de Droit International and also one of the founders of modern international law that and leads us to the first pages of my previous book, The Gentle Civilizer of Nations, which as I explained at the outset, is the intellectual history of modern international law. So I really have very little more to say. Uh, to summarize, I in this book of more than 1000 pages, I examine how how ambitious lawyers, theologians, political scientists, advisors, philosophers, university men and merchants try to react to things that take place outside the domestic realm by employing the vocabularies of law available to them. The vocabularies of law available to them come invariably from their domestic context. Therefore, I use in the book the expression, imagination starts at home. When people have noted, oh, well, this is a very Eurocentric book, I can only say, well, this is a book about European men who try to deal with non-European, both European and non-European uh, world through the experiences and the competencies that they have developed at home. It is the most natural of things that they take those things that of which they know, and they try to combine them and interpret them and use them imaginatively so as to deal with the things that they meet up in the external world. This, the book, the uttermost, uh, To the Uttermost Part of the Earth, is a story of that effort. The, uh, the title itself, uh, of course, comes from the Bible. It comes from the narrative where Jesus sends um, his apostles to the world to uh, spread the good word. But I don't quote the Bible. Instead, I quote the English uh, theologian and colonial propagandist John Donne, whose sermon to the Virginia Company actually addresses the shareholders of the Virginia Company as apostles. And John Don tells these men, of course they're invariably men, sitting there in London as the Virginia Company is starting out its ships towards the new world, addresses them as apostles and invites them to spread the good word of the law to the uttermost ends of the earth. And that's where I end this introduction. Uh, there's very little that one can say after that. Uh, I therefore invite uh, Professor Simon to take over and share his perspective. Yeah, thank you so much, Ankit, for organizing this wonderful event. And many thanks, of course, to Marty Koskeniemi for this great talk. It's really a pleasure to speak to you about Marty Koskeniemi's new book, To the Uttermost Parts of the Earth. And we have already heard a lot of fascinating insights now. So accordingly, I will keep it short right now. In the next 20 minutes or so, Christian and I will loosely tie in with some of the comments and observations we had in a symposium we organized on Marty's new book for Völkerrechtsblock. Völkerrechtsblock is a block on international law and international legal thought based in Germany. But Christian and I, we will do more than that. We will also produce new perspectives by combining some of the approaches and perspectives in Marty's book with our own research interests. So that is very much in the spirit of Marty's understanding of bricolage. So let me start with some words on our Völkerrechtsblock symposium. Naturally, I can't summarize it all, but you still have the chance to read it online. Um, however, I would like to highlight a few points here. First, our reviewers clearly 
highlighted the continuities of To the Atomist Parts with Marty's earlier books, From Apology to Utopia and The Gentle Civilizer. And it indeed seems very plausible to me to argue that To the Atomist Parts connects these two books in quite some ways. It certainly fills an important gap here. Furthermore, To the Atomist Parts can also be read as a prelude or prequel to Gentle Civilizer, as Marty just pointed out. And without wanting to spoil too much, it's really fun to read To the Atomist Parts and end up basically at the beginning of The Gentle Civilizer. So that's really quite great work here, Marty. Secondly, in our symposium, Frederick Daunt has painted out the complexity of this book and its sources, asking whether this is not actually a, quote, history of almost everything. And I think everyone who knows this voluminous book and its great panorama with many voices and sources can only agree with Frederick. Third, there, however, are, of course, limitations also in this book. And Marty also pointed to this just some minutes ago, as Manuel Bastias, Saavedra and Prabhakar Singh have recognized um, there is a certain eclecticism in the book. And Prabhakar has pointed to the central importance of European perspectives on property and sovereignty in to the uttermost parts. Fourth, Alexandra Kemera and Surabi Ranganathan have made clear the importance of storytelling in to the uttermost parts. And in his response to the symposium, Marty emphasized, and I quote him here, that the story format has been helpful since in a work covering half a millennium only very few stories can be told, but they must be told in such a way as to enable the readers to fill the blank spaces in between. All these observations from our reviewers seem to point in their synthesis, so to say, or you could say in their bricolage of bricolage to the central motive of Marty's new book, as I see it, to the uttermost parts indicates that the continuity of legal imaginaries and narratives that persist in political and legal discourse today, and I quote Marty again, cannot be read as a single tradition. Instead, according to Marty, and I think one hears the influence of Foucault here again, quote, different ways of imagining a right to be applied abroad or in relation to foreign peoples emerged simultaneously in different places. They flourished and faded again, just as is the case with ways of speaking and thinking. So Marty's new book also deals, and I quote again, with what used to be called the struggle of the faculties, the fight over authority between professional vocabularies and their attendant forms of expertise. This multiplicity of perspectives, sources, and voices, and their struggle for discursive authority in the sense of Foucault is central to Marty's work. And this now in the second part of my intervention brings me briefly to a narrative of my own research in recent years. In my research on the justification of war and international order, these struggles for authority as described by Marty between multiple normative traditions play an enormously important role. So my core thesis here is that the way war in its normative order have been conceptualized in modernity did not begin to develop quasi teleologically in the early 20th century, as for instance, Una Hathaway and Scott Shapiro have argued in their 
otherwise very readable, the internationalists, but the story of a sudden radical transformation or entzauberung, so to say, seems to me to be too linear. The story, and I hope this is not too banal to conclude, but I think this is indeed true. The story is much more complex. The central narratives of ordering the use of force emerged, in my view, on the threshold to modernity and in the context of the French Revolution. And as Marty describes it in his fourth part of the book, and in perhaps some tradition to Frankfurt scholar Michael Stolleis, there seems to be a typically German problem here. So for German public lawyers like Georg Friedrich von Martens had to relate to the French Revolution and its problems, its questions, its new thinking about violence and the use of force. And they had to deal with these new normative ideas, so to say. From my point of view, however, and there's the struggle of the faculties as described by Marty again, from my point of view, the most important impulses did not come from law, but from two Prussian thinkers outside the legal faculties. First, Karl von Clausewitz, and second, Immanuel Kant. Based on thinking on war, politics, and law, but also social conventions and um, morality, a discourse on the justification of force developed among lawyers in the 19th century who repeatedly referred to these two authors, to Clausewitz and to Kant, and made them, no doubt in some exaggeration, antipodes. And at the same time, multiple arguments of politics, law, social convention, morality, necessity, repeatedly competed here. This complexity leads to interesting stories. German lawyers, for example, noted in the context of the German wars of unification, they understood that legally speaking, they should not wish Prussia victory over Austria, but they still did for reasons they claimed to be political or even moral. Finally, and this is a big part of my thesis, in the German Empire, a language among realist lawyers, or I call them Clausewitzians, emerged that would give birth to what I have called the myth of liberum ius ad bellum, that is the myth of the supposed free right to wage war in the 19th century. So in recourse to Clausewitz, Treitschke, Lasson and others, these lawyers claimed that states could always wage war if they wanted to. But there were opposing voices both in Europe and Germany. And if you look closer at the complexity of this discourse, you notice that German realists like Karl Lüder or Christian Meurer were absolutely outnumbered. They spoke a language of international legal thought that was not suitable for most lawyers in the long European tradition. Instead, notions of just war or Aspirations of use contrabellum in Kant's sense remained most important all over the long 19th century. So here, quite in the spirit of Marty, it becomes important not to abandon the view of long traditions and perspectives of long durée in favor of allegedly radical transformations. So to conclude, starting from the 19th century, the modern discourse of justification and critique of violence has remained a discourse of many different normative and political traditions. This is currently evident, not least, of course, in the context of the discourse on the Russian aggression against Ukraine. 
And here too, it becomes clear what Marty is talking about in his new book and before. Words and you can add imaginations are politics. Words and imaginations actually come into play as actions by producing them. They also compete with our words and imaginations for discursive authority in historical contexts. And they shape our ideas of what is legal and illegal, moral and amoral, political and apolitical. So with to the uttermost parts, Marty Koskinyemi invites us to critically question, reorder and retell these stories in their complexity. And in my perspective, in my view, this is the special value in Marty's books to rewrite and to rethink histories of international legal thought and to critically rethink narratives that shape our own thinking on the world. And with that, I pass on to Christian Pogis and his own stories. Thank you. Thanks, Henrik. Um, before I begin, I would also like to extend my thanks to Ankit for his kind invitation to this book launch event. And of course, to Marty Koskinyemi for providing us with this towering book. Since the publication has already sparked many interesting responses in a series of reviews, symposia, and discussions, the question now arose for me how to contribute myself something hopefully compelling to a work of this magnitude titled To the Uttermost Parts of the Earth in a 10 minute commentary. I have therefore decided to focus on one of Koskinyemi's ideas the aspect of legal imagination as bricolage. In order to do so, I'd like to present myself three entangled short stories with regard to the history of the law of the sea and how they relate to Koskinyemi's new book. So let us begin with the early modern period and its relevance to my stories, which are the story of the Costa Rica packet arbitration in 1897, the story of pearl fisheries at the Rio Linga archipelago in 1902, and the capture of three Danish merchant ships off the coast of China by the Prussian corvette Gazelle in 1864. In 1703, Cornelius van Baikanschuk made in his work Dedo Mindes Maris Dissertatio an argument that was not to remain without consequences for the future. The so called Battle of the Books about Mare Liberum versus Mare Clausum had already come to an end by that time, in which Grotius, Selden, and Freitas featured as the best known and perceived antagonists. Unlike his predecessors, however, Balkanschuk argued from the standpoint of effectiveness in relation to state authority over the sea. Criticizing Philip II for the nautical laws he gave to the Netherlands in 1563. As it was stipulated in them that foreigners are forbidden to attack their enemies within the sight of the land. Balkanschuk states in relation to the so-called line of sight doctrine, and I use here the translation by Megafin, but this also is too loose and variable a rule, or at any rate, it is not very definite. For does he, and Balkanschuk is here referring to Phelps II, mean the longest possible distance a man can see from the land, and that from any land whatever, from a shore, from a citadel, from a city, as far as a man can see with the naked eye, or with the recently invented telescope, as far as the ordinary man can see, or he that has sharp eyesight, surely not as far as the keenest of sight can see. For in the ancient writers, we are told of people who could see all the way from Sicily to Carthage. And so this rule is wavering and indefinite." Unquote. Balkanschuk therefore went on to describe the thoughts for a more appropriate approach of maritime delimitation, and I quote, Wherefore, on the whole, it seems a better rule that the control of the land over the sea extends as far as a cannon will carry. For this is as far we have seen to have both command and possession. I'm speaking, however, of our times in which we use these engines of war. Otherwise, I should have to say in general terms that the control from the land ends where the power of man's weapon ends. 
For it is this, as we have said, that guarantees possession, unquote. Oliver Balkanschuk did not actually invent this idea, which became better known as the cannon shot rule. He took a practice from the French and Dutch admiralties and turned it into an international legal theory by importing it into his treaties. How exactly the generally assumed three mile limit with regard to the territorial sea formed in the following years is not entirely clear and would go beyond the scope of this comment. Nevertheless, this act of legal imagination that sovereignty over the sea relates to the range of weapons, in this case, the cannon, taking into account the current state of technology should not remain without future consequences. And so the bricoleur Balkanschuk triggered a series of further bricolages, some of which he might not even have imagined. Leaving the 18th century and the geographical region of Europe, we now travel to Asia at the end of the 19th and early 20th century. Regarding the first case, the Costa Rica packet arbitration. In 1897, an arbitration award was given by Frederick de Martin through the court of the Tsar of Russia in a case between Great Britain and the Netherlands. One of the questions concerned was whether the British whaling ship Costa Rica packet had been engaged in salvaging a small and abdomen boat in Dutch territorial waters of the coast of Buru and therefore was, therefore was in its jurisdiction. It should be noted at this point that Martens had already pleaded in 1894 for an increase of the territorial sea to 10 miles in accord with the mean range of modern cannons. In Martin's opinion, only this would ensure the effective protection of the interests of the adjacent population, which lives from fishing. Although he ultimately ruled that the Costa Rica packet had not been in Dutch territorial waters, the idea to adopt the cannon shot rule to the actual range of fire echoed in the reception. In the same region, only a few years after the Costa Rica packet arbitration took place, another event occurred that likewise related to the cannon shot rule. This time, however, it was less about the technical advancement of cannons and the increased range since the 18th century, but rather concerned the fundamental idea of being able to project power seawards in order to claim sovereignty. As John G. Butcher and Ari Elson describe in greater detail in the book based on the work in the archive of the Ministry of Colonies, the Dutch colonial minister decided in 1902 to deny self-governing territories the right to sovereignty of coastal waters. According to the author, the question began to arise for the Dutch when foreign companies in particular began to exploit the resources in the waters around the Rio Linga archipelago. An investigation by the Dutch colonial administration revealed that local chiefs in the region claimed jurisdiction over the sea similar to their own understanding of the concept of territorial waters, though apparently based on the line of sight doctrine. Nevertheless, this presented the colonial administration with the problem of possibly losing control over these maritime areas if the rights of the local population were to be recognized. To find a solution, the Secretary General of the Minister of Colonies turned to a book stored at the Law Faculty of, La of Leiden University. In Das Völkerrecht systematisch dargestellt, meaning International Law Systematically Presented, and published in its first edition in 1898, the German jurist Franz von Liszt argued that international law was a product of negotiation between civilized Christian states. Non-European political entities could join the system only if first they appropriated these characteristics and second, if a European state acted as an intermediary, for example, as their colonial overlord. Moreover, he took also the position that territorial waters extend as far as the state is able to project its power and that their actual extent is internationally disputed. Based on the advice by his secretary general and List's argumentation, the minister for colonial affairs eventually decided to deny self-governing realms the possibility of claiming sovereignty over parts of the sea on their own. Only the Netherlands was able to establish territorial waters because the concept was of European origin and inter alia it had the technical, respectively, military means to do so. Before I close, let me briefly turn to my last case. It concerns the capture of three Danish merchant ships in the Gulf of Bohai off the Chinese coast by Prussia in 1864. 
When the incident occurred, the American Presbyterian missionary, V.H.P. Martin, was also near the, near the scene and had just translated Henry Wheaton's work, Elements of International Law, into Chinese. The book, currently still being edited at Tsung Liamen, China's Office for Foreign Affairs, has now come to what is believed to be its first use. While Martin was hoping that practicing international law would bring the Chinese government closer to Christianity, the Yamen used the book in order to pursue the Prussian minister to China, Guido von Refus, to release the Danish ships. It was argued on the basis of the translation, but without naming its use explicitly for the fear of unintended consequences and that the translation actually might turn out as a Greek gift, that the boarding had taken place in Chinese inner waters. Chinese sovereignty and neutrality therefore would have been violated. The release of the Danish merchant ships was demanded as well as compensation for the costs incurred by Denmark as a result. In a memorial to the Chinese emperor, it was pointed out that, and I quote, foreign countries always maintain that the ocean, 10 or more li, one li is about one third of a mile, of the coast, which cannot be reached by guns and batteries, is considered the public area of all the countries and can be sailed and occupied as one wishes, unquote. After the incident, the local authorities wrote anew to the emperor, stating, we, your ministers, find that this book of foreign laws referring to the elements of international law do not entirely agree with our own laws, but there are occasional passages which are useful. For example, in connection with the case of Danish ships captured by Prussia outside of Tianjin, we used some sentences from the book without expressly saying so as arguments. The Prussian minister acknowledges his mistake without saying a word. This seems good proof, unquote. To sum up, the three short stories I've presented here have each dealt with slightly different orientation of bricolage and legal imagination. At least, as I want understand, at least as I want to understand it. Likewise, I hope that they are not simply, and I quote Koskinyemi from his response to the reviews in the Rechtsgeschichte, supplementing an exotic flourish to a conventional frame. On the one hand, Beinkenschuk engaged in bricolage and legal imagination from the aspect of practicability and effectiveness by tying it to the current state of technology. This concept that state power extends as far into the sea as the cannon can carry later played out in different versions as my stories have shown. In the Costa Rica packet arbitration, it was used to argue for an extension of the territorial sea. In the case of the pearl fisheries, the Dutch used it to deny the local population a right to claim a territorial sea on their own. And finally, in the case of China, it was used to argue successfully for sovereignty over coastal waters. But the stories also suggest to one that it is not only international lawyers who are at the center of the stories of bricolage and give a normative power to international law reasoning. The reasoning that makes an offer you can't refuse, as Marty Koskinen might say, and his new book does. Thanks. Professor, would you like to take a moment to respond to these uh, expert comments made, please? Well, uh, thank you so much, Hendrik and Christian. So let just say first that uh, Christian's three examples are perfect. So I, I could have used them and it may be that I will use them in illustration of imagination um, uh, and bricolage uh, at issue. So I have, I have no objection, obviously, to anything of what you said. I thought they were interesting and really good examples. Also good examples because, as you pointed out yourself, it was not just lawyers who were being imaginative there, but other people concerned and the real interests that were at issue for particular communities came out really clearly. And it, that is always the case. There is always some larger interest somewhere that presses the lawyer you know, to try to do something with some new concept or to reinterpret an old concept in, an, in a new way. So I can just say to Christian that no, I look forward to the publication of your work on the law of the sea and on what happens with the gunshot rule and the three, three mile rule and how they're being applied in places. And having been a diplomat once upon a time, also I, I recall distinctly when 
Finland established security zones in its archipelagic waters. And, um, and the great powers, namely Britain, uh, the uh, Soviet Union, and the United States were highly concerned about the, those security zones because they seem to intrude in the right of, uh, of free passage over uh, territorial seas. And in the foreign ministry, we had a hard time trying to figure out how to justify a safety zone uh, exception to the territorial sea. And one of the my, my earliest, and at that time also um, my toughest legal uh, um, uh, assignments was to go to Washington and to the State Department and to explain to the Americans this um, <laughs> this apparent exception from the from the rules. Um, I, I don't think I was very very successful, but I think that the security zones remained nevertheless. So, as in many diplomatic cases, both sides keep their positions and argue innovatively through bricolage for the uh, for their own positions. Hendrik. Uh, now, uh, also really insightful, great points. And I want to go directly to what you said about Clausewitz and Kant and the significance of the revolutionary moment in general. So I think you're absolutely right that, that, uh, that one cannot understand why Georg Friedrich von Martens uh, um, developed the kind of attitude that he did, namely, why he wanted to legalize diplomacy, or why he wanted to start to think of European diplomatic mores as a legal system in operation, merely uh, by looking at what was happening at German universities with the natural law concept. This was a larger, larger thing, and that the revolution was there, and one wanted to stabilize uh, the uh, relations between states there, and of course the 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 levé en masse that the French revolutionary ideology set uh, in motion was something that was very um, very seemed very dangerous for ideological conservatives such as as Martens, the ideas of self determination, etc. And the and I counsel uh, to everyone that to use the foreword from von Martens's um, uh, introduction to international law that he uh, penned uh, in response to Abbe Grégoire's Declaration des droits des gens during the revolution. Uh, so the French uh, Revolutionary Assembly passed this, or never actually was, didn't pass this, but received uh, the draft declaration of the um, of the rights of nations in which the idea of national self-determination was really strongly pushed forward. And Martens reacted to it negatively, saying that that idea was really great, but you know, you can't, in, a re in the real world of things, you can't really operate with such. So I think that's really, really important, uh, that context. But then I think of, of the contrast that you made between these two sets of Reaction. So Kant, on the one hand, his um, critique of the miserable comforters, the previous natural law tradition, and his suggestion of a new kind of a natural law, a formalistic natural law, a constitutionalist natural law uh, that would also contain uh, a droit contre la guerre. Um, uh, uh, that that's there on the one hand, and then Clausewitz as the hardcore political realist. When you, when you were speaking on that, that reminded me very much of, um, uh, of Hedley Bull's anarchic, the anarchic society, uh, in which Hedley Bull um, divides international thinking into three slots. Uh, he uses Kant as the extreme idealist, as you do, uh, but replaces Clausewitz with Hobbes. Uh, and um, and situates Grotius between these two as a so uh, Hobbes as the extreme realist, Kant as the extreme uh, idealist, and Grotius as the moderate legalist in between. 
And, uh, and of course, that's a very suggestive idea. And I wonder what you, how you relate your own um, suggestion to this. My difficulty with it always was that, that these three um, thinkers or texts, uh, um, as well as your two, Kant and Clausewitz, are much more fluid than this threefold division tends to suggest that once one starts to think of or read each one of them in abstraction from the uh, um, a commitment to a prior de a distinction between idealism and realism, then one can easily see how people can use and have used Kant in order to go to war and have used Hobbes to, to defend peace and so on. So I suppose my response to you would be the kind of apology to utopia response that I would not accept that these persons or their, their texts um, are capable of being cited for definite conclusions, for definite positions, because the positions are more fluid. They are apology and utopia positions that at, looked at from one side of, of the world do look, Kant does look idealist from one part of the world, but then again, the, the, the world is full of uh, legal theorists who have indicted Kant of positivism and statism uh, um, and uh, people who still think, and I think some of the greatest political thinkers of the present still think that Hobbes actually was really clever and was able to create an idea of sovereignty, which de facto was a peacemaking device, which is how, um, how Hobbes meant it and how some Hobbesians uh, would have uh, thought of it. So I, that's just my, my only concern. I, I suppose it's a general con concern of these types of of juxtapositions. Um, I have to say, I completely agree with your view of the, the, Hathaway, um, the Hathaway book and the idea, the very teleological idea put forward that the kellogg Bryan pact um, all of a sudden then crystallizes the centuries of, of work. I think it's silly uh, and ahistorical. Um, and but I agree with you that it's a very readable book, and I worry because it's so readable. So people start to think that it's right. <laughs> um, so so there is that uh, that I wanted to say. Um, uh, you pointed out to the continuities between my three books. I constantly think of them as continuous. I see their relationship to each other. It's not that I think that they now cover everything. No, I, I, I see a million things that they don't and that a million things that I would now do differently. Than, but uh, but the effort, my, my effort has been to try to, to sketch the world of international legality from from structural and historical perspectives uh, as uh, clearly as I could. Now, neither one of you took up the most contentious issue here, which I need to then take up, which is Eurocentrism. And the fact that, that all my protagonists are white males from Europe. So is that defensible? Is that still defensible to do? And I've tried to defend that. I, I said in my introduction, that uh, that the work the work puts forward the proposition the interpretative proposition that uh, legal work is the work of imagination and that imagination starts at home and that people <coughs> um, are not universalists without being you know very domestic nationalists and egoists first. Every egoist is a, is a universalist in the sense that they think that the universe is me. They just have a, se a very specific sense of what the universal is. Before uh, Melanie Klein, uh, in Melanie Klein's language, before the baby reaches the mirror stage as is, and is able to separate uh, themselves, the baby and the mother, <laughs> the baby is justifiably thinking that the world is me and everything in the world, that is to say the breast is made for, for me. Now, of course, we believe that people grow out of this, but that's a mistake. We don't grow out of this. We always look at the world from the perspective of the baby uh, for whom 
the world is my concept is what my concepts my experience my education my the ideologies in which i've been embedded tell me and so i wanted to be clear about the fact that this applies to me as self me me myself so i'm this your north european guy from a small town turku <coughs> in finland who you know has traveled a little bit but not that much and mostly in places where the united nations or uh, academic institutions are well uh, presented i wonder how could i possibly take the voice of the non-European, the indigenous, the oppressed person with all um, the (coughs) experience and uh, lack of experience that I have, my lack of understanding and the specificity of my standpoint. Even trying this would to me seem to be an unjustifiable effort to deprive uh, the voice of the other from uh, being heard. So of course I've heard the Eurocentrism point and the male point a a million times. I realize they are valid points. They should be uh, made over and over again, not only with regard to to my work, with regard to other people's works. As Dipesh Chakrabarti has has shown us, it's really hard to occupy a non-European standpoint for instance, to write Indian history as Dipesh was trying to do because the archives were already organized by English historians and English archeologists and English anthropologists and the very language of professional historiography was a Western concoction. So Dipesh was uh, in, in the famous book, Provincializing Europe, was made, putting forward the very brilliant point that the authentic voice of the other is not easily to be found, which is not to be said, it cannot be found at all, but it would be the the height of hubris for a North European diplomat uh, to to believe that he, in this case, is able uh, to do that. Now, Christian and, and, and Hendrik, neither one of you made this point. So I needed to make this for those people who feel outraged and are crying when they see this uh, video uh, as to where is the voice of the other. Um, I'm afraid the voice of the other is heard in other videos and other places, and it's an interesting voice. Um, but I, the uttermost parts of the world, the gentle civilizer, Uh, Apology to Utopia, is an examination of a professional voice that has a European pedigree and also male pedigree. I could have written otherwise had I lived another life, had I been trained in a different way. Um, And I throw these works to people in order for them to do whatever they want to do with them. I don't pretend to tell the absolute and final truth about the uses of law in the world. I tell some stories. And if those stories ring a bell, if there's something true to them, if if they appear to be relevant in some cases, then use them. If they seem to be outrageously wrong and biased and useless, then don't use them to tell other stories. And then we may have a conversation. So that's I just wanted to to say that as well. Well, um, I just want to pose one question, which is with respect to what international law really is, and something that transpired from uh, the discussions which I participated in is, is really, is international law, after all, a subsidiary of empire, and more specifically, capitalism? Is it therefore then just a history of explaining this mercantile system, which is feeding, feeding the crown and, um, and then perhaps legal justifications or imaginations are also uh, explained uh, sovereignty, property, uh, expansion as well. So uh, is it, is international law therefore, or at least the modern conception of international law dating back to when, when this book starts? Because of course you can go further back as well 
uh, to the Indian uh, corpus of writings in the Smritis which speak about the rules of war. Uh, uh, so I'm just very curious to know if this, this, this art of persuasion uh, or, or utility of imagination is actually just an explanation for capitalism and how, how much relevance does it have to the biggest empire of the 21st century, which is, which is the American version. Um, thank you, Ankit. We don't have much time. Those are huge questions. Uh, let me just try to summarize in, in three or four sentences. First of all, I don't believe in reductive explanations. So I don't think the world can be explained from one point. The, the point of capitalism, imperialism, colonialism, liberalism, those words, as I lay out in the book, are whatever else they are, they are also uh, obstacles to knowledge. But on the other hand, they must be used. We must see some continuities in the world. And when I, my, in my introduction, I, I said, a little bit tongue in cheek that this is a, hip, a legal history of capitalism. I merely wanted to bring out that if there is a long durée story to be told, then that story can be summarized in terms of capitalism. And I wanted to link my narratives, the many international laws that I find, the many languages of legality as being in relationship to that larger thing. It, often that relationship is a justificatory one. So people justify the expansion of commerce, etc. Often that is also a critical one. People have used these laws to critique the kinds of imperial expansion and war that exist there. So I don't want to, uh, to summarize, so I don't want to uh, reduce these stories into just reflections of one type of interest or one type of narrative. These are languages that can be used and have been used for various purposes by various people at, uh, at various levels of society and in various relationships of hegemony. Thank you. Uh, it's been a fascinating discussion and I'd just like to take this moment to thank uh, Professor Koskiniemi. And I hold the book once again for our viewers to see, and also this signed, personal signed copy, which I received, for which I'm extremely grateful to Professor Koskinemi. I'd also like to thank Christian and uh, Hendrik for taking our time to do this, and also being involved in uh, deciphering this book, which requires many minds to come together and share their perspectives. Uh, uh, thank you everyone else as well for participating in this discussion. It's truly been quite riveting. Thank you. Thank you very much, Ankit. Thank you.